Hey everybody, you're listening to the Making of an Exception podcast. And today uh, we've got Brian Ingram here. What's up, Brian? Hey, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thanks All so much right. for being here. Brian is the Chief Development Officer. Make sure I get it right. You got the it Chief, right. Chief Development Officer of the Williston Holding Group, which is a organization company that owns a bunch of restaurants, and we're going to get into it today. Maybe give a little more context of what that is. Sure. We uh, we have restaurants kind of all over the country, and we have new brands that we're constantly creating and developing. And uh, we go out and either acquire restaurants that may need assistance and need help with branding, and then our, I'll create them, and we'll go off to the races after that. It's amazing. Uh, Brian, uh, what we're going to talk about today, your story is one of the most inspiring stories I've ever heard. Uh, you're one of the coolest guys to hang <laughs> around, and uh, we've been able to, uh, to grab, you bought me lunch at, at, uh, at one of your restaurants, sure. and uh just hearing your story, uh, when we started this podcast, you were you were one of the first people. Just like we gotta, we gotta share your story uh, because all that you've gone through, what the Lord's brought you through, kind of where you're at today, is just. I, I think it's going to impact a lot of people's lives. It's a miracle. There's no yeah. doubt about it. It's a yeah, miracle. It, yeah, I think. Uh, on a bunch of levels, there's there's a bunch of miracles uh, yeah. that that I see for sure. You see, as well. And so I'm excited to get into it. You, I, one of the coolest things I love about you um, is just uh, not just your heart for the Lord, for your family, uh, but but the way that you're living your life today. It, it's not about you and the world you live in. Uh, there's a lot of people living for themselves. There's a lot of people living for their own, whether it's fame or fortune or whatever. Uh, but at every turn. You're, you're always offering stuff for other people. And yeah, I appreciate that about you. I, l- I learned so the much. hard way going the other direction. It didn't work out real well for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, you, you are uh, a concept guy. I don't know if that's the right way to phrase yeah. it, but you're a genius when it comes to coming up with new ideas, uh, new concepts for restaurants. And, uh, and there's been a, a few and about to be a whole bunch more that have been extremely successful. Yeah, we've been very, very fortunate um, in the restaurant lifespan. It's really all I've ever done. Um, my family, aunts, uncles, parents uh, grew up in the restaurant business up in Anchorage, Alaska and Homer, Alaska. So it's all I've ever done. And thank God I ended up being blessed with a, a mind for it. Otherwise, I would have been <laughs> on the streets because it's all I know how to do. Well, you do it. Yeah, you do a great job. So we'll talk about where you're at and what you're building yeah. uh, in just a little bit. But you just said uh, growing up in Alaska. Uh, Homer, Alaska, right? Yeah, Homer and Anchorage. So when I, I was born in Phoenix and my parents, the oil boom at that time was going on in Alaska. So we packed up, I think I was two, uh, left Phoenix, Arizona and headed to Anchorage, Alaska. So that's, that's where you grew up. That's, that's your, that's that, home. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's Do you still have home. family up there? I have a stepsister that still lives up there. I yep. still have some aunts and uncles that live up there. Yep. Uh, a lot of them left to warmer weather, but uh, yeah. we still have some family that's up there. Yeah. All the folks I went to high school with and all of that are kind of all still in the area as well. What was it like growing up in Alaska? I mean, I, I think of, I, uh, one of my favorite shows is The Last Frontier, Alaska, sure. Last Frontier, yeah. uh, which I love. And that's Homer. Homer, uh, yeah. Right actually, here. Jewel, I went to high school with Jewel. Actually, no. I, I should call it junior high. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, she was at our junior high. She used to sing at the Salty Dog Saloon with their father no. uh, back in the day. So yeah, it was pretty amazing. And then Lincoln Brewster, who is a great Christian yes. singer, Lincoln and I roller skated at the roller rink. No. Lincoln was probably one of my closer friends uh, in middle school. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't know Linka Brewster, Christian artist, and I just, it's in my head, is like, what's the song? Everything he does has these amazing guitar riffs, and it's crazy growing up. Well, he played for a band, right? He played for Journey. Journey. He was yeah, their, yeah. He was their uh, guitar player for Journey, but growing up, he would play Van Halen Eruption. Any of the school like events, he was this long haired, he had the mullet flowing. His uh, older brother, Tristan, had the coolest Trans Am, and <laughs> I, I was just blown away. Tristan, or, Lincoln and I had lost contact, just yeah. l- what happens. And one day I was listening uh, to the radio and I heard this Christian singer, Lincoln Bruce. I was like, are you kidding me? How does, it, how does this yeah. kid coming from what the background and the Lincoln that I knew? And it's just amazing to see that. I, we could spend a few hours just talking about that. That's insane to me that in Homer, Alaska... I mean, it sounds like the middle of nowhere. It sounds it's, like it's like the population wilderness. ten. Yeah, it's, the, yeah, yeah, it's, the t- it's a tiny. It was a tiny, tiny little town. And f- 
from your high school, uh, and, well, just upbringing kids, Jewel, Lincoln yeah. Brewster, and yourself. Sure. How, what, how do you think that happened? Like, was there, I think did, you, when, did you all have the same teacher that like breathed life into no, you? I like, think it's you're motivated when you're stuck in these little yeah. remote towns. It's, for me, anyways, it was how how do I get out of here? Yeah, and it may have been for them as well. I mean, I love Homer and nothing. It was beautiful and amazing, but yeah, um, I always wanted something more. I always wanted to travel. I always wanted to go see other parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure, I mean, Jewel, I think had that same, went to San Diego in a van and, and did her thing. So I think all of us were just, uh, looking to see something more, get out, see the world, do something big. Yeah, man. That's awesome. Uh, how how did you get into the restaurant business? Did your, what did your parents do? I was the worst student on the planet and my mom got me into an alternative school and it was called at that time it was the Anchorage career center. Uh, I think I was in the tenth grade, and they said there's no chance this guy's passing. Uh, so no way. She, yeah, so she put me. You in, weren't going to graduate. High I school. wasn't going to graduate high school. So there was a school called Save Two, um, and they you would go to school for a few hours a day, and then you had to have a job. So I started my apprenticeship at the Clarion Hotel uh, when I was still in high school. Um, oh, and so I did that for several years and then working at my aunt and uncle's restaurant, flips, flying coffee shop, shout out to Homer <laughs> and, uh, working at Which, this tiny, I mean, there, it was my aunt and my uncle was the cook. There was two people working in it and um, it's called flips, flying coffee shop, <laughs> Flips flying coffee shop. And, uh, I was the grill cook, <laughs> so no I would way. work the grill and really, that's really how it all kind of started. And, um, I was like this, I could have a, a, an opportunity cooking really. Yeah. Um, and cooking for me was always how, I guess it was my love language as my wife calls it. So yeah. anytime I could make a meal for my family, anytime I could do any of that, it was our time to get together. So um, I, it's really just became my passion was working in restaurants. And you're saying Flip's Flying is still, still uh, yeah, alive Flip's and well. Yeah, Flip's Flying Coffee Shop still alive and well. It's amazing. Look it up on, somebody's got to be posting yeah. a picture on Instagram or yeah. something from Flip's Flying. We I'm serve 20 people a day. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, it, yeah. I mean, it was, again, tiny. How many flights are coming in and out of home at that time yeah. at the airport? So. That's wild. Yeah. And you, you were saying uh, the, just the way your family was growing up, your parents were working real hard. And yeah. so some of the time, the only times getting together was cooking Yeah, food. it was cooking a meal. My parents uh, at that time owned liquor stores. And my mom, they were just starting out. They moved to Alaska, and it was kind of bust. We all lived in a, a one-bedroom apartment. My parents bought the worst ran-down liquor store in the planet. Yeah. It was close to the airport and literally lived at it. Uh, and downstairs, they would come up. My mom would sleep for a couple hours a day and come back up and work open to close, got robbed, got shot at. I mean, it was, it was no. the wild, wild west back then in Alaska. So they, they were just really hardworking folks. And uh, that's kind of how her journey and really what gave me my work ethic was watching my mom. She was just, you want a hero, you don't have to look much further. Yeah. So, yeah, it was pretty so, amazing. So you, you started cooking meals just so yeah, get a little family time. Get some family time. I'd call her and say, I'm making dinner. And uh, I remember making, I think I was 12 when I made up my first Thanksgiving like dinner. No. Uh, because they were at the, at the liquor store working. And I was like, I'm making dinner. And my mom still has the picture up on the wall. It was all of her best Tupperware set out no. on the table. I mean, just... That's God what you awful. Had. Yeah, it it was horrible, had, yeah. uh, but it was it was awesome. So it was a, it was a great time. Well, I'm 29. I've never made a Thanksgiving dinner, so <laughs> beyond beyond me, I don't even know how that works. Sure, it's crazy. What was life for you like uh, just growing up? Whether it's yeah through high school, uh, like faith journey. Were, were you sure. raised in a what type of home environment? Like yeah, in faith. How so did that play faith. Out? It was it was interesting because my mom always believed in God, but she kept God at a distance because she owned liquor stores. So she was like, I can't go to church. I can't do this. So she would send me with my aunt and uncle to the Anchorage Baptist temple. No way. Uh, So I grew up going to church camp and it almost, I guess, soured me with faith a little bit growing up because I don't know if I was at the right church or the right, but it, it seemed like there were a lot of Christians that judged each other at that church. And yeah. when the offering would come, if you weren't putting in and, and, and from the way you were dressed, I remember going to church camp and we didn't have a lot of money back then. And yeah. you were dressed a certain way and it just almost seemed like we were Christians pressured. putting Christians down. It was a really, it wasn't a great experience for me. So I, I lost my way with faith 
through all through kind of college and even uh, as I was when I first got married, I was if you want to look up the worst husband in America, it was me. I would I called my wife one time from a cruise ship saying I'm gone for 12 days. She didn't even know I was leaving. No. And I, I mean, as far from grace as you could possibly be. That was me. And um, it, it was a really crazy journey for me. And um, thank God, my my now ex-wife, Sandy, um, I think because I was such a jerk, yeah. she found faith, really looking for something. to, wow. And she led our kids to faith. And really, then it became my kids and my now wife, Sarah, that kind of led me back to faith. And I, I remember my kids, we'd be at Costco and they'd be in the shopping cart and they would be singing at the top of their youngs, lungs, yes, Jesus loves me. And I'm embarrassed. I've got no. my head down. Ethan and Meyer are in the front of the cart just singing. And I'm like, what are you doing? Well, they're going to think we're Jesus freaks. And yeah. I, I was out of my mind and I would call my ex-wife. I'm like, what are you, what are you teaching our kids? What yes. are you doing? And it, it was so crazy. So they literally drugged me kicking and screaming to faith. To to yeah. church, yeah. to the Lord. Yeah, it was, it was really amazing. Wow, man. Uh, what, how did you leave Alaska yeah. and start business and start life and, sure. and even family life as well? Yeah. So I, I left Alaska when I was 18. I actually went to uh, um, San Francisco right before the big earthquake hit. I got there yeah. four days before the big earthquake hit no. in San Francisco where the freeway fell was blocks from where I was at in Jack London so you Square show up in Oakland. And the city's falling apart. Literally it's fallen apart. So I went to work for a group called Restaurants Unlimited and that's really where I cut my teeth uh, in the restaurant world. So yep. I did restaurants for them around the Bay Area, San Francisco, kind of all over California. Um, and then I ended up going out to Las Vegas and had an opportunity with an investment group to open my own restaurant. Uh, so I did that for a year. So or two. some company just says, "Hey, we we believe in you." Yeah. Did you have an idea or uh, like yeah. a concept that you were pitching? No, it was it was really kind of I guess organic on how it went. There was a Panos family. They were a Greek family that owned a bunch of Burger Kings, and oh, wow. um, it was really a restaurant built probably on ego. It was called Chris's Place. That was one of the owners' names. Yeah. And they said, "We'll we'll give you the money to do it and give you a free carte blanche. Do what you want to do." Uh, but it's got to be called Chris's Place, and yeah. and that was it. So I went out, did that in Vegas for a year or two, and it just I knew that my ownership and that stuff was never really going to come to yep. pass. So I ended up leaving them. Uh, went to work for a Buffalo Ranch Steakhouse where everybody had to dance like country every thirty no. minutes. And Were it you was, dancing? Oh no, God! I think <laughs> I was in the kitchen <laughs> and, and I didn't have to dance. But yeah. Uh, that's kind of how that journey started in Vegas. And then I went to work for Brinker International and ended up opening literally hundreds of restaurants around the country with macaroni grills and chilies and Maggiano's and that group. So I did that for uh, about eight years. Wow. And then that led me to Chicago with the Stevens family that created Weber Grills, did restaurants in Chicago, um, and then went out to Arizona. That's I, I met my wife on one of the openings with Brinker actually in California, I uh, met Sandy and uh, we got married and went to Chicago for a few years. And then we went to Arizona and I opened up my own restaurant. My parents um, funded me to no open my own restaurant out there. Yep. They were living there. So they said, why don't you come here? We had an opportunity at a golf course to open my own restaurant. Yep. So we did it. And you, you want to talk about somebody that not living for the Lord, somebody incredibly selfish, that, that was me. Uh, so my parents funded me to do this restaurant. I built it, and then I was the guy with the ego. It was, look at my restaurant. I golfed every day, yeah. and uh, my kids were very, very young, uh, like one and two years old. And I was, I was on my motorcycle. I was on my boat. I was doing, I was literally living for Brian and yeah. Brian only. Even my parents were like, you think maybe you want to watch your restaurant today? I was like, no, I got a, I got a tea time at 10 yeah. a.m. It, it was it, what I called and what I still look back on, the person I never want to be ever again was this person. Yeah. And lost literally took me down the most dark, gloomy path you could ever be on. And um, from relationships to just anything and everything you can think of, every bad decision you can make, I was making it. I never did drugs or anything like that, but I was, I was just a super selfish, selfish person. Yeah. How do you, how do you think you went down that road, um, you know, growing up the way that you did, 
you met your wife when you were already kind of successful or, yeah. or feeling that success. When you look back at it, how, what was it just like, man, just the, I think it's ego. I think yeah. that, I think that in the restaurant world, it's almost intoxicating. It's really weird because a lot of people think of restaurants and you think, oh, they're entry level jobs or this, but you're almost, if you're the boss or you're the owner in the restaurant, you have all the staff that works for you and everybody's bucking for positions. So man, everybody's yeah. feeding your ego and you go around town and, oh, you're the restaurant owner and you are you tip more than other folks. So it, it's almost intoxicating. I get, and I let that go to my head 110%. I thought yeah. I was the coolest guy on campus and lived my life that way. And it, it was a horrible, horrible way to live. Yeah, so... so at that point, were you thinking life doesn't get any better than this? Or was there a lot of like internal pain involved? Yeah. Like, I mean, I've got two, two kids now that are, you know, a little bit younger than the age sure. you just described. And obviously, I guess our lives have played out a little bit different. But just even thinking like seeing your kids, were, yeah. were you feeling like, man, the, the world pull, the success, golf, yeah. get on the boat, yep. travel, it's pulling me in, but I'm, I know I'm not living right or like, yeah, was yeah you definitely had turmoil? those internal yeah. conflicts. Like they say money can't buy happiness. And I, I'm here to tell you it, it can't, yeah. um, you just, yeah, no matter. And you, I kept trying to fill that void with yeah. clutter and stuff and dating and all of that stuff. So that empty feeling that I had, I, I was, I would try to fill it through everything, but faith. And, yeah. and that literally caused me to lose everything. I mean, within a very short time, wife's gone, house is gone, kids are gone. And then the last thing to go is business is gone. So I went from the highest okay, of high. So, okay, hang on. <laughs> you, you had everything yep. and you were killing. And <clears throat> knowing your story, your, even your name and, and you call it fame is starting to grow and your yep. influence in the restaurant world is growing. You're making more than enough money. You've got the house. You got the cars. Got the boat. Got everything. Family, kids. Yep. Um, how how do you then go to losing everything? Because you take your eye off it. I'm instead of watching my restaurant, I'm on a golf course. Instead of of uh, spending time with my family, I'm in Vegas with my friends. Yeah. Instead of making any of the sane choices that you can make as a human being, I made anything but that. So. If you're if you take your eye off of what's important and you start making just this accumulation of bad decisions, bad things happen. And and it, the Lord was really working in a, in in a in a great way at that time, and I didn't know it. But so we ended up in a really crazy lawsuit with the city that we had mm. done our restaurant with, and ended up basically they took the restaurant back, but they made my parents whole. They got their money back. So wow amazing that my parents were ever, but I was now unemployed. You had nothing. And I w I'm in a small town up in Northern Arizona and there's no way I'm going to ever go work somewhere and make the money that I was making or do what I was going to be doing. So, and my ex-wife, uh, Sandy, she was, she was out. She's headed to Boise, Idaho to be with her sister. Yeah. Um, and it was just, it was this downhill slide uh, that just kind of happened. And I ended up getting into a really dysfunctional relationship with somebody. So yep. all of those bad decisions just really kind of keep making bad decisions. And that empty feeling that you have inside, you just you keep trying to fill it with clutter. Yeah. Um, and for me, it was never... Uh, for some reason, it didn't dawn on me that, hey, <laughs> why don't you go find a church and, and yeah. do something? I was just pushing back, like going... Yeah. No. And um, ended up going to Las Vegas and met with a friend and he's like, hey, I can get you in uh, with MGM. I've got a I know somebody over there. You're going to have to start at the bottom and prove yourself. Yeah. Um, so and you, that's what we did. So at that point, you lo lost your wife, lost your kids. Yep. Because I'm, I'm assuming the kids go with kids your ex-wife. Kids go with the ex-wife. Yep. You lost your restaurant. Lost the restaurant. Thank God your parents were taken care of. Yep. That's fine. But then... Then you, you have to start an entry-level position. You move to Vegas. Yeah, so I went from well, owning my own restaurant to being the assistant manager at the pub restaurant. I think I was making 30 grand a year or something. I mean, it was not that that matters, but yeah. it was it was a, a huge step from where I had went. My I, I get to Vegas, and, of course, I don't have insurance on my vehicle, and I pull in the parking garage, 
uh, and my truck gets stolen out of the parking garage. No. So now I, I call my mom. I'm like, oh, my truck got stolen. She's like, well, just call your insurance. And I was like, yeah, no, about that. Um, and again, my folks saved me. So they pay off the vehicle for me yeah. uh, because I still owed money on it as yeah. well. So they bailed me out and they're like, but you, you're on your own for what you do next. Yeah. So I'm at Walmart. Here I am. I think I'm 30 years old. I'm at Walmart buying a bicycle uh, to no. ride to work. Uh, this is to a guy a that manager. was driving a Hummer, pulling a boat, doing all of these things. And now I'm riding a bicycle to work and I'm embarrassed because I can't let I'm just the assistant manager, but I don't want my staff to see me riding a bike. So I would chain my bike up about a half a mile away and, and chain it up in. to a fence. And then I would walk in. Um, and somebody saw me once. They're like, Hey, I saw, were you riding a bike? I was like, yeah, I'm trying to get in shape. So no. I played it off like, Hey, it's just me trying to get into shape as opposed to, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't have a car. No. How long, how long was that journey of feeling like you had nothing? It was, it was, uh, it was about a year. Um, so I ended up moving in with my friend, Noel, living on his couch in his house or not as he actually had an extra room. So it was a bed. Um, so I'm living there and I had heard about, um, central Christian, this church there. Um, and everybody kept inviting me and saying, hey, you should go. And the, the lady that I was in a relationship with at that time, she was like somebody from work had told her that, hey, we should go. Um, so we ended up going to Central Christian. And I just remember their message was completely different than any message that I had ever heard at church. It was, it's okay to not be okay. It's yeah. okay to be broken. It's okay not to be, <laughs> I'm going to cry on it. Um, it's good. It's just okay to be screwed up. Yeah. So that, I was screwed up. So that resonated with me. Wow. What was your perspective like of God? Not just, not just the church, because you grew up feeling, maybe feeling like church was, you know, as you described, going to camp or whatever it was. Sure. Like there's these rules and you got to, yeah. you got to come in hiding your issues and and even the pressures and the Christians judging each other. So now you're hearing a different yeah. message. You know, what's, what's actually the, like your relationship and perspective of God at that point. So, so everything kind of changed after that. It was, um, at my whole church upbringing, Southern Baptist was fire and brimstone. It was, it wasn't a church of grace. It was a church of, beating you down and saying yeah. you were less than, um, and at least that's what I remember it or how that's I processed it. Felt like, it. Yeah. yeah. That was my journey was everybody's less than hell is coming and you're going there and yeah. there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so, and I always, anytime I would stumble or I would fall, I'm like, I'm, I'm destined for hell. So it was completely different to hear, no, you're not. You're, you you have hope. You have grace. Yeah. You have all of this. And Sarah and my wife now, even she struggled with that in the beginning. We were talking. She processed kind of religion like that. I'm like, babe, it's about grace. It's not about this. So it was a it was a crazy journey for me with that. And it was not that monetarily or any of that has anything to do with it. That God did all of these things. But it was amazing how He started moving in my life and yeah. changing. I guess my decision making. So within a very short time, I kept getting promotion after promotion after promotion. And finally I, I met this gentleman that came in. He's like, I'm building all these restaurants in New York with the Rooney family that owns the Pittsburgh Steelers, Alain Ducasse, the most decorated chef in the world. We want you, we've seen what you've done here. We want you to do this. And it was just so crazy how, and literally within two years, how my life changed and, and it was just it was just an amazing kind of journey for those two years of I was still in a really dysfunctional relationship. Yep. I still had a lot of baggage. I still was making poor decisions, but at least I that pit that I had in my stomach, I could figure out a way to fill that. Yeah. Um, so my bad decisions became less and less. There were, I mean, there were still a lot of them, but there weren't ninety five percent of my life. Now it was probably down to thirty five yeah. percent of my life. Wow. Um so it just it was amazing how that all changed. And one day we got the offer to say, hey, you want to move to New York and uh create a couple restaurants in New York. And um we packed up, we went to New York, um and I was in New York for a couple of years having 
uh, still a, a very, very dysfunctional relationship. Again, and we stopped going to church when we moved to New York. Yep. Um, and things started going back the other way. Yeah. There, were, there was, again, some bad decisions that were being made and some, some things and ended up having an opportunity to come to Minnesota and uh, jumped at it. What did you think about Minnesota? It was crazy because I had never been here. And here I am coming from New York. And I'm like, Minnesota, what am I going to move to Minnesota for? And uh, we had a, a restaurant group here that uh, had one restaurant. It was our first New Bohemia. Yep. And we, uh, we opened our first New Bohemia. And um, we started having some success. And um, I met my now wife. I, I, I left the relationship. I was in New York. I knew yep. that that was probably the single biggest thing in my life that was still holding you back, still holding me yeah. back and holding me back. So I met Sarah actually at the first new Bohemia Yeah, and she came up and I was wearing Converse and she had on Converse. So we, yeah. she's like, Oh, those are cool. And Sarah lived in New York for a short time and we yeah. just kind of hit it off and they were having pedal pub races or something. And yeah. we both went and rode these pedal pubs and I'm the boss of the restaurant. And I look at her and I'm like, if we're going to do this, you have to quit. Yes. <laughs> we, we can't do it. So she quit. <laughs> and, yeah, no um, way. and Sarah and I kind of started on this journey and we, she had been, she was from Minnesota, has a huge family here and yeah. one of the most amazing families you'll ever meet. I mean, they're centered in faith and they're just amazing. And we were going to a church that she kind of grew up when, yep. but it wasn't really resonating with us. Yeah. And we, so we started jumping around and going to all these churches and it was really cool because I had never been in a relationship with somebody where faith was important. And yeah. I think I put on Big Daddy Weave Redeemed in my no car. Way. For some reason, that song really resonated yes. with me. And it was on our first date. And she was like, oh, I love this song. And that's really how that all started. No way. And then we, um, she, everybody kept telling her about River Valley Church. She worked yeah. at Lush and she's like, River Valley, River Valley. And she goes, we're going to go to church at a bar next week. And I yes. go, no, we're not. And she's like, yeah, we're going to the poor house. And I was like, I'm not going to the poor house to go to church. I, I work in restaurants and bars. I'm not going to church in one. Yeah, yeah. So she literally again drugged me, kicking and screaming. And we're halfway through the service. We see you. And I'm like, he looks like Rob Deerdick. <laughs> I'm like, there's no way Rob Deerdick's <laughs> so funny, yeah. doing, doing service. And your whole presentation, and I think it was one of the days you were preaching, was the mm. first time I had been. And it was just such a different hmm. uh, experience for me. And we were we were hook, line, and sinker. We were in. Yeah, well, hopefully not to me, but <laughs> hopefully to the Lord. Yeah, and, absolutely. And what he's doing in Minneapolis. And, yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. And we yeah, we had the opportunity even to baptize you guys. Yeah. And uh, you've been extremely generous to the church, but not just to the church, but to the city and the people we're trying to reach. Um, you know, that you, you would never ask for this, but even just donating food, you know, from from the restaurants that you're owning to do serve your city events and picnics and all that like you've given so much and it's making a huge difference and so it's been an honor even just the last few years to kind of do this yeah this journey together a little bit in trying to make a difference in Minneapolis and St. Paul and you've even over these last three years, you've opened a bunch of restaurants yeah, locally. Yeah, we, we did seven uh, new Bohemias over the last couple of years. And then Truck Park, uh, I created a couple of years ago on West 7th. I think it's been a year and a half now that we yeah. opened up over on West 7th. And it, it was, again, just to bring it kind of full circle. So you have this guy six years ago that's seven years ago riding a bike to work. And then all of a sudden we started having all of these amazing things happening from we won and for the entire country, one hottest concept in the entire country with New Bohemia. With, with um, New Bohemia? Yeah, with New Bohemia. No so we get the calls and all the magazines and Food Network and Travel Channel and all of these things just kind of start happening and and the contacts that we're meeting. And it's there's no reason for any of it because the, there's just not this kid from Alaska that has probably a horrible education. And all of these doors that are not just yeah. getting open, but they're getting kicked open. I mean, it yeah. was, it was just a crazy, crazy experience to kind of live this journey over the last few years and see how, if you try to live a little better and you yeah. start living for the Lord and you know that all of it's kind of centered around Jesus, it just, yeah. it changes everything. And I mean, people that would listen to this may go, that's not the Brian I know. I've heard him yelling or cussing in the kitchens yeah. and I'm not by, I'm not, 
the best You're Christian in the person. world. Yeah. I'm not perfect. I make really bad decisions a lot, but I, I know that I, they can be forgiven. I know that I can do better the next day. And my wife tells me all the time, she's like, hey, do you really think, would, uh, what, do you, what would Jesus do? Yeah. I'll be on the phone in the car on a conference and talking to uh, an architect or somebody that's behind schedule and I'll start losing my mind. And she literally reaches over and squeezes my hand and gives me the look. And I'm like, yep, gotta, yeah, gotta I, be I gotta, yeah. gotta be better than that and do better. And uh, I was sharing with you earlier, I had yeah. some guys that worked for me and um, I'd show up on a Sunday morning at, at work and they'd look at me and they're like, we don't need you here. Go to church. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't like Brian that they could tell that you yeah, had been to church. They could tell if I went, if I missed for a week or two, because again, it just, it was my counterbalance. It would, it would, it would get me back to where I need to be. And you can get lost in this world very, very quickly and yeah. get caught up in this world very, very quickly with all of the stuff that goes on and especially in a restaurant world. I mean, we have so many suicides and so yeah. many horrible things that are going on in the restaurant world because 99% of the people in a restaurant, they get done. They, you have a really tough shift. They all do the same thing. They all go to a bar, they yeah. all commiserate. And wouldn't it be amazing if they could find hope and find yeah. other things. So it's, it's crazy. And the, that's one of the things my wife is, relentless about and yeah. she is um she'll she invites anybody and everybody to church and it, it's wow. so crazy she'd be working a food truck at truck park and everybody would always even say to me like it's a bar it's a restaurant how you, you guys are selling this or you're selling that you can't be a christian yep. sarah's bold she's working the grilled cheese truck and she's like where do you go to church do you go to church and she's inviting wow. people to church and i was sitting back and i'm like am i gonna get sued for this are we allowed yes. to do this <laughs> And I was just like, <laughs> my wife going to get a suit. Is she gonna, yeah. and, but I was just like, she's smiling. And I, I've seen, we had a guy that came in and was literally trying to get our business for credit card processing. Yep. He was relentless. He kept coming in and coming in yeah. and coming in. And Sarah invites him to church. And I don't know if he came to church the first time because he thought he would get a sale or something, yeah. but he came to church. Who cares? He came to church. Yeah. And he's now a member at River Valley, no. Minneapolis, and he comes what? every week. I see him every single week. I see him and his family coming. And it's just so cool to see how just Sarah with her boldness and her yeah. faith, she, I mean, and maybe those people wouldn't, and because it is a bar or a restaurant, and maybe yeah. they wouldn't exactly. have those opportunities. Exactly. And she's... She's relentless. I mean, people that work with us, and she's not, she's not going up and making somebody feel pressured. But no, she'll, no. she'll post on social media or just subtle them. What are you doing tomorrow? Oh, I'm going to church. If you ever want to come, you should come with me. Yes. So she's the coolest person ever. Yeah. Yeah. No, she is. She is awesome, yeah. and she serves. Uh, like, it's just cool. Like, you guys are living a really big life. Even some of the stuff that you'll talk about in a second with Wilson uh, Holding Group, but like. You guys serve, you guys aren't above serving what may be entry level. I mean, she serves in Go Kids, yep. like like taking care of the kids during church, you know. I sure. think knowing the life you guys are living and just the bigness of it and the scale and the travel and just new concepts and ideas. You're about to open up a couple of restaurants in Minneapolis, you know, and then she's, she's serving the children yeah. at church, you know, like... I think that that is the coolest thing that no matter how high you go, that you guys are living a life that you're not above anything, you know, sure. above doing, doing anything. And even your story, your story of losing everything. And it's amazing how fast you can ruin your life mm -hmm. by the way that you're living. But it's, but it's infinitely more amazing how much faster God can redeem your life. Yep. That everything can come back. Like as fast as I could ruin my life, God can even faster turn my life around so and true. bless it beyond belief. I, I, I'd love for you to even talk about just your, even your kids, your relationship with the kids. Like yeah. throughout all of this, you know, you lost your family, lost your ex-wife, yep. your kids moved to Idaho. Yep. And, but then now, now they're in high school. Yeah, now they're in. And my kids have always been just so faithful. My daughter's been serving in her youth ministry since she was seven. Uh, in Idaho. So she, I mean, their, their faith is just insane how faithful they are and how uh, really how they even keep me on track. Even if yeah. sometimes my language is colorful and they're like, dad, yeah. 
Um, but their, their journey has just been amazing. <laughs> Dad, stop it. Yeah. Um, and since they were little, so for their, probably from the time they were one and two till the time they were five, I didn't have a lot of contact with them because I, I just, I didn't make time to go see them. And then yeah. one day something clicked that it was anytime I can have them, I have to have them. So yeah. it started out, they just spent every summer and every Christmas, anytime they were out of school for more than a weekend, yeah. they were with me. Um, and they really helped me on my faith journey and um, even helped with Sarah and my proposal and everything. They were like, dad, you got to marry her. You've got to, they, no they just way. loved her and saw like her faith. But Ethan, my son, even Maya, but Ethan can quote any verse in the Bible. And I'm horrible at remembering yeah. verses. He'll say one John and he just goes on and on and on. Yeah. Uh, and it's just so cool to see a kid Every decision he makes is faith based. He broke, he had his first girlfriend and they broke up. And this was right before he moved here to live with us. He was in Idaho and he, he prayed about it and he said, it just wasn't right. So I broke up with her. All the kids at school were making fun of him because they were, she told him, well, he prayed about it and God told him that yeah. he shouldn't be in yeah, this. Yeah. He, he wasn't even remotely No high faced. schoolers doing that. Nobody does that. And even when we'll ask him, he just went out for soccer this year and, um, a bunch of the kids had asked him, he's a pretty fast kid. They're like, Hey, we, we saw you in track. Will you come out for soccer? And he's like, let me pray about it. Wow. I've never seen a kid. And I keep waiting for the wheels to come off because when I was his age, that wasn't me. So no. but every decision he makes is based on faith. And he'll even challenge Sarah and I on our faith and how we deal with certain situations and stuff. So it's really amazing to see a kid like that, um, that that has this faith and Maya the same thing. She wants to she wants to stay in ministry. She wants to go to college for ministry, and wow. she's just it, it's really amazing to see how these kids are are coming up in faith. And uh, Ethan, we recently he moved in with us full time yeah. and started at Concordia Academy. And again, just to see a school like that where faith is everything. And Ethan will come home and in worship today. And I was at a soccer game and. Every time before soccer, they pray and they're praying for the other team. No way. And it, and you're just, it's so cool to see, I guess, that. And everybody in this world, you can watch the news and you can see all of this madness that's going on. Yeah. Um. And then when you see that, it's like it's, it's it's going to be all right. The, the next generation is going to be just fine. Yeah, because Ethan's leading the way. Yeah. Your son, man. Yeah. <laughs> that's Pretty awesome. Amazing. Yeah. God doesn't. Just, yeah. He he can't. It's not just about redeeming the stuff. Yeah. Uh, but he can redeem relationships and restore yeah. relationships and your family is so tight knit now. I know both your kids Yeah, and they're the coolest and they love you. They, I mean, they look at you as a hero. Like yeah. I, I can see it in their eyes and just their relationship. You can tell like you're, you're a hero to them. And I know that they inspire you for sure, for sure. but it's just so cool how there's been moments where you haven't lived the hero's life, Yeah, but somehow God is, brought your family close together and you still have that you know we all we all make mistakes none of sure. us are perfect uh but we can still yeah make a difference and be somebody to look up to yeah uh for sure and and it really the the i guess the cautionary thing that i even i sarah and i have this conversation i get to get a lot of the accolades i get to go on tv and be on food network and travel channel and have all these crazy opportunities and she's at home with ethan and she's working at go kids and um, sometimes she'll even say to me, she's like, I just don't feel like I'm doing enough. Or I'm like, are you mm. kidding me? You're yeah. a go kids. You're what yeah. you're doing is important. What I'm doing yeah. is nothing. It's wow. what I do is a paycheck. What yeah. you're doing is life changing. So it's yeah. crazy to try to find those, uh, ca counterbalances or yeah. whatever. Well, so. what you are doing is life changing. Uh, I, I remember you even doing an event, uh, at one of your restaurants to just collect winter clothing for homeless people. Uh, in St. Paul and, and making a huge impact. So uh, don't Again, think, my don't, wife. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, okay. Sarah, again. Yeah. Uh, you again, do the right thing yeah. to deflect, but yeah. you, are, you are making a huge difference. Thank you. Um, I'd love for you to share just some of the concepts and things that are about to happen in Minneapolis. Sure. Whatever you can share without yeah, getting in abs trouble. Absolutely. So we have a couple new concepts that are going to be opening here in yep. Minneapolis that we're super excited about. Uh, we have a concept called Cargo Food Authority that we're actually going to be doing in several places around the country as well as here in Minneapolis. 
Uh, cargo so Food Authority. Cargo Food Authority. We basically took a bunch of shipping containers and we turned those into what I would call a modern day food court, so to speak. So yeah. one of the shipping containers will be doing sushi, burritos, and poke bowls. Another one will be doing my interpretation of chicken wings. And I like to do things a little different. So it's using duck and geese yep. and uh, doing them with curries and misos and those type yeah. of things. So not the Buffalo Wild Wings style of wings, but kind of a yeah. more unique twist on them. Yep. We're going to be doing some really cool tacos where we're doing roasted El Pastor and shaving it right off the roaster and onto handmade tortillas. So wow. we're really excited about Each that. Each one of those coming out of a different shape. Each one, almost like yeah. A, it, it would feel like a cafeteria. Almost yeah, it's interactive. Is, yeah. I call it interactive dining. So you're yeah. walking around the space and you're trying new and different foods. Yeah. Um, it's really tough in the restaurant world these days. It's if you're if you're Olive Garden, that's all you're ever going to be. Or if you're Buca de Peppa or any restaurant yeah. chain, you have to be that all the time. You can't suddenly yeah. say the trends have changed and nobody's eating pasta anymore. Yeah. Um, so I like doing concepts where you can change and you can be relevant and you can do different things. And really, that's yeah. what's resonated, I think, with that's all what the, Truck Park was. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's that same kind of deal where you can try different foods. Yeah. Um, so it's for me, it's yeah. How do, how do you resonate with today's folks and do it in fun and unique ways? So I think this will be a really unique way to do it. It'll Where's be, that one happening? Uh, that's going to be at Target Center. Yep. And then we have um, Bus Stop that's going to be opening across from Viking Stadium. Yeah. And Bus Stop was really a 1920s bus depot. Um, First Avenue was the original like kind of Greyhound bus depot here in town. Yeah. Yeah. So. To me, I've always just liked that architecture from the 1920s and yeah. that uh, I really, that just kind of resonated with me. So we found some buses from the 1920s and 1910 uh, and we're going to put them inside and you'll sit inside of these buses. We're going to have some really fun, unique burgers. So we'll do burger bowls. So if you don't want to eat a hamburger, we'll turn yeah. it into a salad. So yeah. we have about 12 custom burgers that you can either eat as a salad or you can eat them as a burger. Um, and they're really just fun, unique blends. We have one that's called the Bigfoot that's <laughs> oxtail and skirt steak and all of these things that Crazy. are custom blended. And we, then we have everything from salmon burgers and chicken burgers and all of these really kind of fun, unique blends. We're doing fries like you would get at the state fair that are yep. a spiral cut whole yep. potato. And um, I just like doing kind of my interpretation on foods that are relevant and that yep. people are used to eating, but doing them in kind of fun, unique ways Yeah, uh, has been kind of... I guess what my calling card is for, for the restaurant world. Yep. Um, so we're, we're super excited about both of those. And again, God's just opening doors and it's really crazy. I, um, people ask me all the time, how did you get that location? So like Wrigleyville, we just got a location in Wrigleyville right across from Wrigley stadium in yeah. Chicago, national chains wanted all these people wanted it. And how to, how were we fortunate enough to get it? And I swear all, all, I was in Chicago and you go out and you walk, I will walk out in front of the restaurant and you pray about it. And you're like, God, if you can open this door, if you can do that. And so people are always asking me, how, how did it happen? It's like, it's not through anything that I've ever done, because if it was, I would be at Flip's Flying Coffee Shop in yeah. Homer, Alaska. It wouldn't, these doors wouldn't be yeah. open. So it's really crazy. And I'm excited you and I are going to go pray over yeah, the, yeah. the new restaurants here in the coming days. And I'm not praying for wealth or praying for money. For me, it's how, how can we use these and do really cool things? I mean, I think we can touch people in restaurants yep. in ways that they don't even know it from our staff and seeing how we act as a human being. Maybe we inspire yep. them and they're like, why is he different or why is his wife different? Um, so for me, that's really the coolest thing. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Do you start construction on those uh, 2019 or they're happening? Yeah, they're right under now? construction. We're hoping yeah. to have them open in late October of this year. Yeah. So Timberwolf season's coming, so we want to have that open. Football season's going Wait, so, on. So by the time this this episode will come out in October, so as you're listening, yeah. th they're opening, you're saying? We're, we're, we're hoping for the third week of October, yeah. Wow. So yeah, come over so go and check uh, out the bus stop and bus stop and cargo food authority. If you come in, ask for, ask for me, hopefully I'll be in there and we can uh, yeah, yeah. talk. So I'd ask love to. for me. I'll be in there eating a burger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's amazing. So, uh, I guess a couple, a couple last questions, uh, even just wrapping up this episode, but, um, what are you, 
besides these two restaurants, uh, what are you dreaming about? I mean, you're part of the Williston. It's called Holding Group, yeah, right? Yeah, Williston Holding Group. We're we're just praying that our group that we can continue to actually make sure that we're providing for the families and the workers and everybody that are going with this as we grow. We're, we're excited about bringing people up within the group. And frankly, for me, it's praying about how do I just be a great leader and inspire folks. And even we have lots of folks that I work with that don't have faith and how do yeah. I lead them to faith really just through my actions and through hopefully they see something different in me and uh, yeah. lead them to a different way. So wow, that's what I'm praying for. Uh, quick question. Maybe you got it at the top of your head is what we, and we ask every guest, but what's, what's the favorite, your favorite book you've ever read? It was actually, and it's it's not. I, I just finished reading Anthony Bourdain's uh, yes. book, and uh, for me, the Kitchen Confidential. The reason I liked it is I grew up a line cook, yeah. and it's a super disturbed world that you live in. Yeah. Um. So I really enjoyed kind of reading that. I wish he could have found faith along the way, and yeah. and maybe uh, life could be different. So that that's one that I I read, and I was. And he's somebody that you knew. In he's the somebody that I knew yeah. in the restaurant world. I, I got to meet him several times. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, it just goes to show you, you can have it all or from the outside, it can look like you have it all and you don't have anything unless you have faith because it, it, it just, I mean, you, you see from the outside, yeah. everything's great. Uh, so I really resonated with me because I, I knew that life and my life yep. could have very easily gone that direction. Yeah. You're saying, um, you're saying Anthony Bourdain's, uh, kind of upbringing in the restaurant world. Yeah. You, you were doing the same thing. Line doing, cook. Yeah. Same you're line cooking again. He was doing drugs and all of yeah. that, but the same thing that he talks about is how it's so incestuous and everybody kind of, yeah. everybody's dating each other. It's like this super vicious circle. And again, there's just a lot of lost folks in that world. Yeah. Um, and a lot of folks go into the restaurant world because they don't have a, another job and that's their only opportunity. Yeah. So it's, it's a tough, tough world to come up in. Um, and, and alcohol is readily available. And yeah. so money, there's instant cash every single day you get tips. And what 99% of the staff do is you they all find it, the yeah. bar and they go spend it all. So it's a world that needs Jesus in a really yeah. big way. And that's something I'm really praying about for even Target Center. I would love to do a, a gospel brunch on Sundays and we yes. bring in like worship music and do some really full, cool things that I think restaurants can be used in different ways. And um, it, it doesn't necessarily, yes, we have to sell beer and wine and those type yeah. of things to, to be a viable restaurant. But I think you can you can also make a difference uh, in in that world. It For doesn't sure, have to I agree. Be. Yeah. yeah, and we'll do it. Whatever yeah. you want on Sundays, man. We'll <laughs> send over the choir. Right. <clears throat> it's amazing. Uh, what's what's one piece of advice you've given a whole bunch of inspiring things? But one piece of advice uh, to somebody following in, in your footsteps? Maybe it's sure. a line cook listening right now, or somebody yeah. that's working a restaurant job, uh, but that would aspire. I mean, I, I think hearing your story. There's people listening in the restaurant world that actually have never even thought it could be possible for them. But hearing your story, they go, maybe it is possible yeah. uh, to kind of grow up in this world and make a difference. But what's one piece of advice you'd give them? Uh, really, the biggest thing that I would give anybody for me, my world changed really when I met my wife. I mean, if you are in dysfunction and you're in a world that you know isn't right and you're going to bed every night and you're going... This just doesn't feel right. If you're not, if you're not with, if your significant other, or your partner, isn't leading you in a great and inspiring way, you, you, you got to get out of it because yeah. it just leads you to such dark, dark roads. And then again, faith. I guess my biggest thing is, as Christians, you don't have to be perfect. I'm far, far from yep. perfect, and people could see me on the street tomorrow and go. I can't believe he was on the podcast. Did you yeah, see yeah. the way he was? Oh, man. We're, we're all going to make yeah. these horrible mistakes or we're going to do these things, but it doesn't matter because we all have faith. Jesus died on the cross for yeah. us. So it's, to me, it's, it's, so that, that really resonates. It's okay to not be okay. It's yeah. okay to come to church. If you, whatever you did, you went out and partied last night, you made the worst decisions. Yeah. You can, you can come to church. Still you can, show up. You can yeah. show up and things can change. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, something that we say all the time at church is, you know, that you, you get to walk into church uh, 
even if you don't believe that you should be able to feel a sense of belonging, yeah. uh, even if you're, you didn't live a life that lines up perfectly with the Bible, uh, that's okay. Cause the pastor hasn't either, you know, <laughs> uh, and we're doing the best we can and we need Jesus. Um, and I think a better way to look at who God is, is he's not, he's not pointing at our sin. Yeah. He is, he's saying, yes, you've fallen short. Yes, you've made mistakes, but he's pointing at what Jesus did on the cross, paying for all of those sins, perfecting us and putting us back in the right relationship with him. It's the coolest thing. That's what grace is. That's what yeah. the gospel is. And you're living it out in an amazing way. And I'm just stoked to see what happens Thanks. even in the next few weeks. Uh, some exciting stuff happening in your life, uh, but also over the next few years of what God's going to do through the restaurants that you're owning all over the country and in Minneapolis. It's amazing. So I just want to say thanks so much for being Thank on you. the podcast. You are, you truly are. If anybody, if anybody hates on you for being on this, dude, <laughs> I'll punch him in the throat. So <clears throat> yeah, you belong here and it's just awesome. Where can people find you if they, if they want to look it up? I mean, they sure. can look up your restaurants for sure. But. You can go to Restaurant Guru on Instagram. My yep. wife came up with that. It wasn't an ego thing, I promise. No, yeah, uh, yeah. So Restaurant Guru on Instagram as Sarah yep. set up kind of my stuff on any of the social medias if you put in Bing Concepts is kind of yeah. what my company stuff is so you can find me on any of those and um, we've got a couple shows coming up on uh, Travel Channel and Food Network on yep. Outrageous Eats and Food Paradise so if you want to see a Check fat guy stumbling over himself Stop you can, it. <laughs> you can watch it Amazing, well thanks again for being here We love you We love you back, thank you Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this, we'd love for you to subscribe to this channel. We've got new episodes releasing every single week. We'd also love to hear your questions or comments. You can uh, comment below. You can also find us on Instagram at Exception Podcast. And I want to give a quick shout out to our producer, Tissel. My name's Kirk Graham, and we'll see you back next week.